Hello, ladies and gentlemen. So we are learning about aquatic biomes today. So aquatic means water, and biomes are places on Earth that all have the same ecosystem. And fair warning, Nova's totally going to bark any minute because she's growling at the door. So I'll pause it, though, maybe. So there are two major aquatic ecosystems that you need to know about. And that's really the gist of it. You learn six terrestrial, we're going to learn two aquatic, and that's that. So three quarters of Earth's surface is water. So 75% of Earth's surface is water. So many organisms actually live in, on, or very close to the water. Um, there's oceans all over the place, and then there's not just oceans. There's lakes, rivers, puddles, streams, creeks, all kinds of different areas on Earth that are covered in water. And quite frankly, evolutionarily, so according to evolution, it's believed that most life actually started in the ocean because of a lot of reasons. Uh, you don't have to worry about the UV rays from the sun. So if you are like me, you get burnt, okay? Um, some of you might not get burnt. You have nice tan skin or dark skin, so you don't get sunburnt like I do. But the sun actually puts out very harmful UV rays, and it causes all sorts of mutations in your skin, as sunburn, skin cancer, all kinds of stuff. So being in the water, actually, deep in the water, actually helps prevent that. Um, another reason is it was just, quite frankly, easier to breathe in the water. Uh, gills, remember back, oh goodness, I don't even remember when, we learned about notochords and throat pouches. You actually had slits in your neck that were supposed to be gills. So we can kind of conclude or infer that we most likely started our lives in water because of those. So there are only two aquatic ecosystems we need to know about here. Fresh water and marine. That's it. So salt water. So just fresh water and salt water is all we're concerned about here. So abiotic factors still play a part here. Pop quiz in your head. What does abiotic mean? If you said non-living factors, then you are correct. Good job. Particularly sunlight is very, very important because sunlight still does go into the water. Um, so this allows plant life to grow. Kelp, algae, all kinds of other plants that I don't really know their exact name of, but they're out there. Ooh, lily pads. Nailed it. So they still photosynthesize here. So these plants actually need to live at a place in the water that's near the surface, but not too deep. Okay, so they can live a little bit deep. Think of kelp. Kelp grows down to the bottom, okay, especially in Finding Dory. We saw the big kelp forest where Dory finally found her parents. Uh, so it can grow a little bit deep, but it cannot grow down, down in the bottom of the ocean. There's no light down there. And then actually, fun fact, half of all the oxygen on Earth comes from algae. So when we talk about deforestation and cutting down trees, which is totally really, really bad, um, yes, we would be losing oxygen, but we wouldn't actually run out of oxygen. We would just have significantly less oxygen because this algae, this green stuff floating in this picture here, actually creates half of what you're breathing right now. So if you've ever seen a lake or a pond with some algae on top of it, just next time say thank you. Thank you for making the oxygen I'm breathing. And then throw a rock in the, in the pond and walk away. That's what I would do. So only about 3% of the water on Earth is fresh water, which means not salty. So this includes streams, rivers, ponds, and lakes. Okay, so uh, Lake Anna is fresh water. It's not salty. It's never been salty. All of the little streams and rivers and creeks that lead up to Lake Anna are fresh water. Those are all fresh, not salty areas. Now, I definitely don't go out and drink this water. It's still not healthy for you. If you've ever watched Naked and Afraid, which is a great show, um, but maybe inappropriate because they're naked. And then I would be afraid because you're 12 and 13. Um, anyway, they always boil their water first. Remember when we learned about protists and bacteria? There are protists and bacteria in every little bit of water out there unless you clean it first. So bottled water is clean. If you boil your water, it's clean. Uh, you can't just go to Lake Anna, take a gulp of water, and be like, ah, delish. Uh, that's no good. You might get a brain-eating amoeba, so don't do that. 
So specifically, we're talking about streams here. Streams can start at mountain bases. Small streams lead to bigger streams, and then they go into bigger streams called rivers. So you can see here in this little pic, we got, oh boy. Okay, I can't move my mouse because that thing's going to pop up. But pretend you're following where I'm pointing. There are little streams leading up into this dark, this guy. Okay, here I can point. Look, right here. There's a little stream here. And this little stream is leading into a bigger stream right here. This bigger stream is then dumping into this river. Okay, so little bodies of water actually do eventually flow down, 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 down into a nice big river somewhere. Um, all of our water, at least where I'm from up, up north from in Pennsylvania, we have what's called the Chesapeake Bay watershed. So all of our water from Pennsylvania and Maryland actually streams and flows down into the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, I think you guys are maybe part of that, but I would have to do some research and figure out what part of the watershed we are. Um, but we might even be part of the Lake Anna watershed. I'm not sure. Ponds and lakes, these are standing bodies of water. So streams and rivers are moving, they're flowing. Ponds and lakes, they are still or standing. So that's Lake Anna. There's no waves in Lake Anna unless a boat goes by, okay, which there's lots of boats. So lakes are often larger, deeper, and just generally bigger than ponds. A pond might be somewhere like in your backyard, you go fishing, and then you catch a fish and you throw them back, and then you fish again. Um, lake Anna is huge. Uh, you know how big it is if you've ever been out on the lake. It's in like two or three different counties. Um, it's all kinds of branchy, branchy. The map of Lake Anna is nuts. Um, so definitely lakes are generally bigger. Think of the Great Lakes, the five Great Lakes up near Mass or uh, not Massachusetts, Michigan. So they're all nice and big. Ponds are often shallow enough that sunlight can reach the bottom, but lakes, most likely this is a picture of a lake. Lakes don't typically have too much plant life down towards the bottom because it can get pretty deep. I know where I go swimming in Lake Anna with Nova, um, there's some plant life there and it tickles my feet and it freaks me out. But we go, we go swimming where it's nice and shallow, so the sunlight can actually reach the whole way down. Um, but out in the middle where you most likely are going fishing or tubing, most likely there's not too much plant life there because Lake Anna can get pretty deep towards the middle. So animals here have to be adapted for still water. So not any animal can live in a lake because it's, it's just one circle. That's it. There's nowhere to run and escape. Um, there's no new animals coming into the area. You're stuck with just the water you're stuck in. So a lot of times scavengers like catfish live on the bottom of the ponds and feed on the remains of dead. Um, I just want to brag for a second. When I was little, I caught a catfish and it was real big and I was real proud. So, huh. Um, so catfish do live on the bottom. A lot of times they'll eat dead stuff. Bacteria and other decomposers still play a part here. Okay, this is an ecosystem just like anything else. There's still a food chain here. So the bacteria, there's um, maybe some kind of krill or crab or something that eats the bacteria. And then there's a fish that eats the crab. And then there's a catfish that eats that fish. And then there's bacteria, again, to be decomposers. So there are still food chains. There is still a food web here in all of the lakes, rivers, and streams and stuff like that. So... We're connecting, now we are connecting freshwater to marine life because all water flows and it flows until it has nowhere else to flow to. So this is where estuaries come in and I think this word sounds familiar from last year. Estuaries are where freshwater and saltwater meet. So a river flows directly into the ocean. Uh, ah, <laughs> a lot of time water is very calm here. It's not wavy, it's not too fast flowy. So a lot of times animals will use this as a mating ground. A lot of sharks actually, specifically the bull shark, what I'm thinking of, bull sharks are real nasty. They're really mean. Um, kind of think of them, I don't know. Not all pit bulls are mean, but pit bulls are bigger. They got big heads. Bull sharks are the same way. They got a big head and they're real mean, but pit bulls aren't all mean. So. Think of it like that. Bull sharks swim up into this area and they lay their puppy eggs, not like my puppy, but like they call baby sharks pups. They lay their pups in this area, this area right here. Okay, So you can see in this area right here, it's fresh water coming in this way, it's salt water coming in this way. So it's like 
half salty water. And it's really calm. It's really relaxing. It's kind of spa-like, if you ask me. So then the pups, once they get big enough to move, they come right back out here. They follow this little channel. They go out into the ocean, and then they start eating old license plates and tires and stuff like that. Mostly just kidding. So estuaries are where fresh water and salt water meets. So salt water are going to be just the oceans. Around 70% of the Earth's surface is covered by oceans. There's like, what, five, six oceans now? I don't know, a bunch. Okay, they're all salt water. So 70% of the oxygen we breathe is produced by oceans. So al algae can still grow in the ocean here. That's why those numbers are feeling like they're not going to add up, but it totally still does. Oh, I might have to yawn. Nope. Okay, so ocean life has a bunch of plant life as well. So there are three parts of the ocean we need to kind of know a little bit about. The intertidal zone, the neuritic zone, and the open ocean. Just like where Dory lives. The ocean, open ocean exhibit. So starting at the beach, intertidal zone. This is where the shore is, kind of like where the sand meets the water. Okay, they can uh, have a lot of waves here. So organisms need to adapt in order to be able to survive with these constant waves coming through. So some adaptations in order to survive the waves um, would need to be, one, they don't get dizzy. Because I know when I get knocked over by a wave, I go under and I get spun around. I get real dizzy. Um, they have to be able to have really good eyesight or another sense. Because where there's waves, there's a lot of sand being kicked up. So it's not very easy to see. If you've ever tried to look like through goggles right where you are with the waves, you can't see anything because it's very sandy. So that needs to be another adaptation. That they have. The neuritic zone is a little bit further out. We still have shallow water and there's some sunlight here because it's still fairly shallow. This is where the coral is going to be living. So it's past where you normally can reach. You might go out where your, your head is just above water, but you're still in that intertidal zone. The neuritic zone is a little bit out past that, a little bit deeper. The water is probably 10, 12, maybe 20 feet deep here. Um, it's, it's not yeah, I mean, the biggest point I need you to know is it's past where you normally stand. And then the open, open, oh, open, open, she's Louise. Open ocean, it is very deep here. There's a variety of organisms, a huge amount of biodiversity. So bio means life, diversity means differences. There's a huge amount of different forms of life here. Uh, think about all of the animals you can think of. There's a bajillion, that's not a real number, there's a bajillion amounts of fish in this area. There's all types of corals and jellies and sea, sea stars and those little sne sea snake things, walruses and killer whales and sea lions and all of these organisms live here. And obviously any animal in the ocean needs to have, a, have an adaptation because the ocean is salty. So they need to be able to withstand their body being around salt all the time. Wow, look at that beach. In case you've never been to a beach, it doesn't look like this. Imagine if there's 100,000 people on this beach, because they're always crowded, and take away those trees and put in some hotels, and then the water's way too clear, so go throw some mud in it. And then that's what the beach looks like. Nice. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> So that's that. Uh, so really not too difficult today. There are six terrestrial biomes. There are two aquatic biomes, freshwater and marine, a.k.a. saltwater. Um, that's really kind of all I need you to get out of here. So I think that's it for me. Look on Google Classroom or look at the front whiteboard to figure out where you need to go next.